I want to introduce my audience to Jonathan Al Khouri. Jonathan, he is uh, from a small, originally from a small Christian community in Lebanon. Uh, he's now a prominent Israeli activist, uh, working tirelessly to promote ties between Israel and the minorities uh, in Israel. His project, uh, uh, Reservist on Duty, now Diplo uh, Act, has defended Israel from its detractors on uh, college campuses across the United States. Mr. Al Khouri, you are most welcome on the Capitol Show at the University Club here in Washington, D.C. I want to tell you, um, I want to ask you to tell us your story. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Uh, so my story basically begins when I was born in south of Lebanon in a small village uh, to a father that served in the South Lebanon army and after Israel's decision to withdraw from South Lebanon in May 2000, my father moved to Israel and afterwards we followed him after a year and a half because life in Lebanon wasn't safe anymore because Hezbollah started to take over our villages and we had to flee. Uh, that's how I found myself at the age of nine, uh, taking my mom's hand, holding two teddy bears under my shoulders and uh, fleeing through Cyprus to Israel. Can you tell us your uh, thoughts about the uh, 7 October attacks and uh, how is your, reaction, your reaction about it? Yeah, exactly. First of all, uh, Israel welcomed us as the Lebanese in Israel. They gave us shelter, they gave us uh, ID cards also, so we are 100% full Israeli citizens. But during that time, I'm also Lebanese, so this is something that I was able to persuade and to continue on saying it out loud, that I have these two identities that are connecting me. And one of the reasons that I supported Israel throughout the years is not just only that we were allies back then in the 70s and 80s, and now today it's my home, but because I feel we share uh, um, mutual values mm -hmm. of democratic values, of being able to live alongside each other and being able to thrive as these two societies should have done so long time ago mm -hmm. and since October 7th happened it really reminded us especially the Lebanese living in Israel in what happened to our parents and grandparents during the 70s because of the PLO the Palestinian Liberation Organization led by Yasser Arafat they have done the same things to us like Hamas did on October 7th to the south of Israel um, so we, we share this uh, mutual, you can say, DNA of survival that both our communities have in the Middle East and that's why I believe that we need to support each other, we need to connect and be able to protect each other as minorities living in the Middle East. So we can see that you are beyond uh, the uh, being uh, like uh, a minority in Israel, uh, you adjust uh, the life in Israel, can you tell us more? So the South, uh, the South Lebanon army community in Israel is about 680 families, we're 3,500 people, that's the estimation that we have, and we all still live in the north of Israel. Uh, we have, uh, in, in not only in one city, we're really across all of the north of Israel, but we maintained our kind of way of life like it used to be in Lebanon. We still have the Lebanese traditions, the Lebanese language, we still uh, have it and speak it. We are super proud of it. Um, the holidays that we celebrate, we celebrate it in our Lebanese traditions like we used to back at home. Um, and we kind of maintained also friendship with the rest of the South Lebanon army community because at the end of the day, we're a really small tight community that the majority of us marry within the community because we want to preserve uh, our heritages and our language. How the Lebanese community live in Israel? Do they have great jobs, uh, good careers? Are they successful? Yeah, of course. Well, the South Lebanon army, well, if you want to like uh, uh, differentiate. Oh, Lebanese. Lebanese. <coughs> yeah. If you want to differentiate, for example, the difference between my generation and my parents' generation, my generation was integrated 100% to the Israeli society. 95 of us uh, uh, serve in the military or national service. We grew up in the Israeli uh, education system. So we kind of felt part of this community because the community let us feel part of it. Mm -hmm. So for example, growing up in my high school, um, I was given the chance to kind of teach my fellow students 
students about the South Lebanon Army community or the Lebanese community in general uh, to talk about our shared values. Um, one example that I will never forget is that uh, during my middle school and high school, the school gave us the opportunity to read a prayer for the South Lebanon Army fallen soldiers mm -hmm. that fell throughout the years while fighting shoulder to shoulder with the IDF soldiers. And it will be in the same day and right after the prayer for the IDF fallen soldiers. So they gave us the feeling that we are 100 uh, percent seen and that we are 100 percent of the Israeli society. So I want to clarify a thing, why uh, the, the Lebanese uh, South uh, Army was defending or fighting side by side with the I, uh, IDF at that moment? Can you tell us uh, wh what is that, wh was it allowed at that time? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, we believe that we had no choice uh, but to fight alongside with the Israelis um, for a few reasons. One reason is that because our parents wanted that war to end, they didn't want to have ongoing fights between Israel and Lebanon. And second of all, the Lebanese government abandoned us, abandoned the South Lebanon in general during the 70s when they gave permission to the PLO to settle in our villages and to butcher us, and the Lebanese government didn't do any, anything to protect us. Mm -hmm. So our only chance was uh, to find that the Israelis are suffering from the same enemy that we are suffering from and collaborate on that matter that we are both being persecuted by that organization, by the PLO terrorist organization. Mm -hmm. And um, the Lebanese government was on it from the beginning. They sent parts of the Lebanese military to assist and help the South Lebanon army liberate South of Lebanon from the PLO's hold and from them terrorizing the South Lebanon army community. Um, but throughout the years when Hezbollah took over, they kind of tr started to change the public opinion in Lebanon against us. Mm. But when you look at it, the South Lebanon army never fought against the Lebanese government, never fought against the Lebanese military. So the Lebanese community can never mm. accuse us of treason because we never betrayed Lebanon. Mm -hmm. We were doing Lebanon's job. I have to promise my audience on a documentary or another uh, interview with uh, uh, many people talking about uh, the Jaysh Lahad and what is the story, uh, what was the uh, misunderstanding and are they traitors or not. Let's talk about it later on, uh, inshallah. So first of all, I do public diplomacy. I share my story as an Israeli citizen, as an Israeli minority, uh, because I believe that there's a lot of misconception that goes on about the Israeli community in general mm -hmm. and about our life as minorities living in Israel and how we are treated, how is, are we are equal to the law and that's something that I believe that we need to share and kind of um, expose to the world because there is really few uh, kind of knowledge about it and a lot of the anti-Israeli movement use the minorities in Israel in order to attack Israel or say that it doesn't have any right to exist mm -hmm. and that's where I found myself in a position where well, I had to fight also for the name of the South Lebanon Army community and myself. I also now have to kind of uh, um, help and assist my country because we're facing the same thing mm. of being misunderstood, of being um, kind of skewing the history in order to attack us and bash us. Mm. And that's something that I believe they need to do. So I do it on social media and now I'm here in DC because I'm part of a delegation mm. on a speaking tour. I've been doing that since 2016 in order to expose uh, the lies that are said by the anti-Israeli movement against us. Uh, so people knows you on, I know you and people knows you on Twitter, on social media. Uh, what is your diplomacy? What are, is, are the missions or the visions that you promote? Uh, what are you advocating uh, for uh, the existence of Israel. Please, can you speak more? Oh, I'm, I'm really hoping for that day to come, and I do believe that the true Lebanese understand that Lebanon's liberation at the end of the day will come by signing a peace agreement with Israel. We have seen Jordan sign a peace agreement, we have seen Egypt sign a peace agreement, we have seen the UAE sign a peace agreement with Israel, we have seen now Saudi Arabia maybe is planning to sign a peace agreement, Bahrain, Iraq, not Iraq, uh, uh, Morocco, Kurdistan, Kurdistan is, is thinking about it. So 
This is where the world is going and Lebanon needs to catch up because at the end of the day, no one will invest in Lebanon if there is this war that is going to stay on kind of hiding above it. Um, and in order to Lebanon to go back and become the Switzerland of the Middle East like it used to be, or the France, Beirut, the France of the Middle East, they need to sign that peace agreement. And I do believe that we have true Lebanese that support that idea and that they know that Hezbollah doesn't Hezbollah, Hezbollah's presence in Lebanon needs to be eradicated and needs to be eliminated mm. uh, because they're controlling and taking Lebanon into this, into this doom. You witnessed the Abraham Accord uh, signing or uh, the uh, implementation of Abraham Accords. You were in Dubai uh, when that happened. And uh, of course, you promote Israel-Arab uh, relations. Uh, do you think one day Lebanon uh, will be allowed to sign or to have an agreement with Israel, peace agreement? I do believe that Hezbollah today is the main obstacle for having a peace agreement between Lebanon and Israel because when we look at it, Israel's uh, intention was never to have any fight with Lebanon. We've seen that the last fight that the Lebanese government or the Lebanese military fought against Israel was in 1947. Since then, there was no actual fight between these two countries because there is no actual kind of disagreements between them. And the only things that I can think about is just like few, and the only obstacles, for example, that you, not obstacles even, like some of the dispute is about like land dispute that Israelis are willing to negotiate with the Israelis, with the Lebanese, because we've seen what happened with the Meritor Agreement just a year and a half ago. Israel was willing to, to negotiate and the Israeli public opinion was that Israel Israel gave too much to Lebanon on that matter. But we've seen that Israel is willing to negotiate that. And uh, for example, the, the last war that we had in 2006, it wasn't between Lebanon, the government of Lebanon, and Israel. It was, again, against Hezbollah, because Hezbollah started that war when they kidnapped three soldiers uh, on the border with Israel. Otherwise. Israel has no issues with the state of, of Lebanon and with this independent and being a sovereign state. So we understand that uh, the only obstacle for Lebanon to be in peace with Israel is Hezbollah. Hezbollah is kidnapping Lebanon. Uh, uh, yeah, this is the main obstacle, uh, despite that they are Lebanese, but they follow the uh, Iranian regime orders. I believe that uh, Iran's main role here is, is to make sure that this area will, will stop being stable uh, because their mission at the end of the day, and they speak about it mm -hmm. all across the world, is to make their presence in that area from Iran to Syria to Lebanon 100% reply to the Iranian regime's uh, thoughts and, and kind of aggression. Mm -hmm. And that's something that a lot of Westerns don't really realize or understand. That's why we're here. Mm. At the end of the day, Israel is the front line of what could happen to the West if Israel falls. Mm. And that's something that I believe that all Western countries need to support Israel in its fight against terror, whether it's Hamas, whether it's Hezbollah, and whether it's the Iranian regime that is basically sending their proxies, or through the Houthis in, the, in Yemen. That you can see Iran's hands in every action that goes against Israel in, in the last few months. Uh, this leads me to a question concerning Iran and the role in Iran in the region. They don't want any stability uh, and they are uh, working on spreading terrorism elsewhere. Uh, how do you see the role of Iran and its proxies in the Middle East? First of all, Israel has any right to exist in its ancestor lands for the Jewish people uh, in the land of Israel. Um, we have seen so many times that Israel have made major, uh, um, um, you can say sacrifices, in order to build that peace. You can see with Jordan and you can see with Egypt when Israel returned uh, the Sinai to, to Egypt. Um, and that's something that is really present because when we talk today about well, the two-state solution, mm. We're not talking about 75 years of occupation like any others are now implying. Gaza was 100% under Hamas's rule since 2005 when Israel, again, sacrificed its own people and took them out of that land and gave it 100% to the Palestinians. And that's something that the world, in a way, not only doesn't see, but they're being led by a huge anti-Semit and anti-Israeli movement that has been infiltrating 
college campuses, infiltrating the media, and infiltrated every place with, dec with decision makers. And that's why our work is super important in order to change that. Mm. What you can tell the people that believe that Israel is occupying Palestine and there is no way to two-state solutions? So how this historical conflict can end, uh, in fact? So one of the major things is, first of all, Al Jazeera is a Qatari-owned uh, uh, news outlet. And it's well known, it's well published, and th uh, since the beginning, even before October 7th, they have been leading this anti Israeli agenda 100%, even so with their Arabic division, with anti-Semitic and even uh, denial of the Holocaust even occurring. And that's something that I believe every democracy has the right to defend itself. And because Al Jazeera is, is a major outlet, they are on the ground and at the end of the day, they're changing the reality and persuading different image from what it is on the ground. And I believe that this is uh, Israel's right to defend itself as a democracy against a foreign government news outlet that is in its uh, place. I want to end this interview by asking about latest news. The Israeli parliament has approved a law giving the government the power to ban broadcasts of TV channels, uh, including Al Jazeera. Uh, so how we can say or we can ask the behavior of Arab media anti-Israeli propagandas? Yeah, well, we can see the connection between Al Jazeera and Hamas when, when everything that Hamas is published is immediately, even before Hamas published it themselves, appears on Al Jazeera with the videos that they have exclusivity on, with all the narrative that comes out from Hamas. Mm -hmm. We have seen their ties, and this is something that Israel needs to make sure that doesn't exist in its land. Many thanks for seeing you here, uh, Jonathan al Khouri. Wherever you are, you have a unique life experience. Uh, felicitations, congratulations. I'm so proud of you as Lebanese and hope to see you again. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. And we need to keep on uh, talking about it and, uh, and presenting this story to the world. Future interviews, indeed. Thank you very much. Shukran.